New Hope family and anyone else joining us, thanks for tuning in on a Sunday evening to share just a few moments in God's Word together. I'm coming to you tonight from my home. Thanks for taking me into yours via the airwaves. We're all spending a little more time at home these days, and hopefully that hasn't gotten you down. But if it has, you've come to the right place because the topic tonight is something we all need a little more of these days, and that is joy. You know, we've been sending a lot of stuff out recently to encourage your faith through difficult times, but uh, all that can get a bit heavy after a while too, so uh, we just need a, uh, an infusion of positive vibes, so hopefully tonight we'll provide that. But in a time when people are faced with a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and things are changing from day to day, how can we maintain or even gain a greater sense of joy? Well, let's go to what is hopefully a prime source of joy for you as it is for me, and that is the truth we find in God's message to us in the Bible. And we're going to look at some things from the New Testament letter to the Philippians. So if you got your Bible, turn there with me to Philippians. Because one of the overall themes of this letter uh, is joy. And that's extremely significant uh, if you consider the circumstances under which Paul wrote this letter. Paul was a pioneer missionary to uh, help establish the church in the Roman world at that time. And his letter to the believers in Philippi was written from prison. And he was there because he was preaching about Jesus. Now, people to this day write a lot of letters from prison. They write to loved ones. They write to their lawyers, to their congressmen. They may write to colleges or whatever. They might be appealing their case or complaining about the conditions or just getting stuff to keep, keep them occupied while they're confined. But whatever they're writing, it's probably not conveying a sense of joy. I can tell you if I were in prison, especially for doing God's work, and there's a lot of places in the world where that could happen, uh, I'd just be honest with you. I, I'd probably be uh, ticked off, maybe despondent, and, and just venting to God about the injustice of it all, and why me, and what did I do to deserve this, and just struggling to find joy. But Paul, who had not only been thrown in prison, but had been beaten beforehand, and now was chained inside, was still expressing joy. In fact, it was within that Philippian jail that to the story you heard of Paul and Silas, who sang hymns at the midnight hour, and all of a sudden an earthquake came, and a jail break, and before all was said and done, Paul had a chance to lead the prison guard to Christ, but it all started with expressing joy. And that's the power and influence that godly joy can have. We're going to look at that in just a moment about the, the power and strength of joy. But first, let's back up just a second and define a couple things. You've probably heard uh, someone try to define joy or, or the difference between happiness and joy by uh, saying that uh, happiness depends on circumstances, but you know joy is deeper than that. Or happiness comes from outward things and joy from within. Well, I'm not going to get caught up in semantics because the Bible uses happiness in a deep way as well. In fact, when when the Bible uses the word blessed or blessed, like Jesus did in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, that word blessed could be translated uh, happy or fulfilled. Because when your happiness or joy comes from God, it won't depend on circumstances. And that's why Paul was able to be joyful from a jail cell. Because joy is a powerful thing. It can sustain us through all kinds of stuff, uh, even a worldwide pandemic. So just for a few moments, I want to consider some thoughts about joy that might help you keep a hold of this incredible gift, regardless of what's going on uh, around us. So turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4. Philippians chapter 4, I want to look at verses 4 through 7. After Paul gets through the whole book, talks a lot about joy, and he's kind of winding things down and summarizing things. In Philippians 4, 4, when it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want to briefly point out five key aspects of joy because when it comes to following Christ, joy is not just a gift or a benefit. It's a necessity because joy is what gives us strength. And that's the first point I want to make is the strength of joy. Because if we're going to grow spiritually and fulfill God's purpose for our lives, we cannot do that effectively without joy. It's not just a matter of a desire or discipline or determination. You can have all those things, but without joy, 
uh, you'll never accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in the way he wants you to do it. It's almost impossible to keep up anything, including our walk with God, uh, if we don't take joy in it. And I want you to think about this for just a second. How often do we gauge our spiritual health and, and uh, how we think we're doing in our relationship with God by uh, how strong we feel at the time, how much we're overcoming uh, our fears or, or conquering temptation or persevering in all the right disciplines or just overall living that victorious Christian life. And in other words, uh, the stronger we feel spiritually, the better we think we're doing and the more positive we are about our relationship with God. And that seems to kind of make sense on one level, but on the flip side of that, when we feel weak and vulnerable and lacking discipline and giving into temptation and not making progress spiritually, then we feel uh, discontent or guilty or even depressed about our spiritual life. And the bottom line is we tend to base our spiritual satisfaction and joy on how strong we feel at the moment. The problem with that is it leads to all, all kinds of a roller coaster ride of emotions. And Nehemiah chapter 8 kind of addresses something uh, to that effect when uh, it talks about God's people had just returned from, from exile because uh, their history had, had continually been spiritual rebellion, going their own way and imitating the ungodly nations around them. So God allowed them to be overrun by their enemies and taken captive into a foreign land. But just as he promised, he brought them back to their homeland and they had rebuilt walls and homes and now they were gathered to hear God's law being read and they realized how short they had fallen in the past and they were really stressed out about it. But Nehemiah reminded them that this was no time for sorrow and grief, but it was a time to celebrate and start fresh. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, he reminds them that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I want you to notice the order there. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Too often we think if we can muster up enough desire and discipline and determination to do what God expects and, and if we can gain enough strength to move ahead spiritually, well then we're going to feel good about things and we're going to find that joy. Uh, in other words, we rely on strength to produce joy. But that's backwards, and it doesn't work. As followers of Christ, we're not joyful because of our strength. We gain strength because of the Lord's joy. The joy comes first, and our strength can't produce anything because we don't have any strength in ourselves. But we don't have to get joy uh, because of something within ourselves because our joy comes from the Lord. The bottom line is no joy, no strength. We're strong because we have joy. And we see this principle in all aspects of life. I mean, people who don't take joy in what they do are hardly ever uh, effective. And the devil knows that. That's why as much as anything else, he tries to steal your joy. In John chapter 10, verse 10, when it says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, what he's often attacking is our joy because he knows if he can rip off your joy, he can rob you of the strength to resist him or to be effective in God's work. But don't ever forget this. The devil at his nature, at his heart, he's a liar. And so when he tries to rob you of your joy by attacking you with guilt or fear or anxiety, uh, don't give in to the lie. Don't give up your joy. And I know that's easier said than, than done to hold on to your, your joy because you can get caught up in the same cycle as trying to muster up your own strength. You're trying to rouse up your own joy, but we don't have to create our own joy or find a reason within ourselves because true joy comes from God. It's built into our relationship with Him. And that's the second thing I want to point out is the source of joy. And that's the Lord himself and everything he's done for us. The scripture describes David as a man after God's own heart. And David recognized the need for joy when he had failed God miserably. He had committed adultery. He had uh, set up a murder. He, he lost a child and was just in a virtual state of depression. But in Psalm 51, 12, he pleaded with God to restore unto me the joy of my salvation because he knew that he couldn't carry on without the joy. And, and Psalm 113, 5 is just one of the many places where David talks about uh, rejoicing in God's salvation. The, the writer of Psalm 66, 6 says the same thing about rejoicing in God. And, and even Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
uh, after the angel had come to her and revealed that she would uh, give birth to a Savior, and she was visiting her uh, cousin Elizabeth, who uh, would give birth to John the Baptist, and, and the Spirit of the Lord came over Mary, and she kind of prophesied in a song and said, I will rejoice in God my Savior. You see, joy doesn't come from what we do or don't do or, or how strong or successful we feel. True joy as a follower of Christ comes from what God has done for us. And I want you to just think about that for a moment. If you find yourself struggling to keep a hold of your joy, the fact that the God of all creation wants you to know him personally and gave his son to make that possible. And if you've entrusted your life to him, you are forgiven, you're free, you have a fresh start. Uh, you're unconditionally loved and accepted, which is something that, that everybody's looking for. You have all access to the God, uh, the creator of the universe, anytime, anywhere. He's restored your ultimate purpose in life. And, and no matter what happens, you have the undeniable hope of spending eternity with God. Man, I don't care how we feel. We have every reason to be joyful. And because God doesn't change, none of those reasons for joy change. And so our joy doesn't have to rely on, on shifting circumstances or things of life that, that we have or don't have. And that's why you see some of the most joyful believers in places where they have virtually nothing in the material sense because they don't rely on those things like we tend to. Their joy is based solely on their relationship with Jesus. And because of that, it doesn't fluctuate with emotions and circumstances and surroundings or what others think or do. And that kind of outlook frees people to have joy all the time. And that's the third point I want to make, is the situations of joy. When can we have joy? Where can we have it? Well, Philippians 4.4 4 pretty much just sums up the, the when, when it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. And Psalm 66.11 uh, pretty much just sums up the where because it talks about being filled with joy in God's presence. Where is God's presence? Everywhere at all times. So anytime, anywhere is an occasion for joy. The only time when really we don't have full access to joy is when uh, we're purposely doing things that the, the Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. If we're doing things and, and thinking things and going to places and treating people in ways that don't please God, then then yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be unsettled and discontent. But as long as we're trusting Jesus and doing things he desires, you have absolutely no reason to lack joy because it's not about you or me. Uh, it's about him. And if you feel your joy waning at times, then check your focus. Is it on yourself? Is it on your situation, your needs, your problems? Or is it on God as the one who can solve those problems and meet those needs? Or, or is it on how we can help and, and benefit others? Because one of the ways that God continues to enhance our joys is by providing opportunities to help and encourage other people. Because people who are focused on themselves are always going to lack joy. But we all heard the biblical adage that it's more blessed or more joyful to give than to receive. That's when we find fulfillment as followers of Christ uh, because that's when we're truly following Jesus' example. Luke chapter 22, verse 27 says that Jesus was among us as one who serves. And that's the fourth point I want to make is the service of joy. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 begins, Do not uh, do, do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't do it for yourself, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And what was that mindset? Uh, it goes on after that to describe how Jesus put aside his own prerogatives to provide the only solution to our sin problem. And in so doing, he made the only way for us to have a relationship with God. And just as he gave himself to solve our biggest need, he wants us to follow the example and to help meet others' needs. You know, before Jesus died, uh, he shared a last supper with his disciples. And at that time, he performed one of the lowest acts of servanthood when he washed their feet. But he did that as an example of what uh, he expected them, of them to serve each other. So if you're lacking joy, try serving others. 
That's when we find purpose and fulfillment. That's when we're being more like Jesus. In fact, when we serve others and meet their needs uh, for Jesus' sake, we're actually serving Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 25, one of the few passages in the scripture that, that talks about what it's all going to come down to on that day, on that judgment day. Now, we're not judged by uh, our works. We're, we're saved by our, our, our relation with Jesus, but the Bible does make it clear that we are judged and evaluated during that time by the things that we've done or not done. And Matthew chapter 25 makes that clear when he, he separates people and those he calls to into his eternal reward and to share the joy of the Lord. He, he says to them, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And they, they said, Lord, when did we do all these things? And he said, as much as you have done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And you want to do something directly for Jesus? I mean, your hand to his? Then look for him in the, the eyes and the lives of people who are hurting and in need. There's no greater way to influence people for Christ than to serve them in his name and to be joyful as we do. And that's the last thing I want to point out uh, is the sharing of joy. One of the primary reasons to let joy uh, show in your life is not just for your own strength and, and, and spiritual uh, fulfillment, but to influence and inspire others to trust Jesus as well. Philippians chapter 4 of 5, and let me read it in the message. It says, celebrate God all day, every day. Uh, I mean, revel in him. Make it clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up at any minute. And all that is essentially talking about how joy can be one of the most effective means of witnessing for Christ. Nothing that we have spiritually is meant to keep to ourselves. Just as God is a giver, he wants us in turn to share all he gives us. And that certainly applies to joy because that's one of the primary things that all people are searching for. So when it comes to joy, we need to show it. We need to share it. Listen, if, if people don't see joy in us, then why in the world would they want what we have? But if they see that joy, especially at times when they know that they don't have it, uh, that's the most convincing proof that I think we can offer that we have something real and something that they need. When people see us serving with joy in all situations and they realize that it stems from our relationship with God, they're going to be willing to listen to what we have to share. They might even ask you about it before you, you tell them. Uh, so let that joy show because that's the greatest witness you can have for Christ. Now, I'm gonna, before I close, I want to just uh, caution you of something that as quick as anything will rob your joy. And it's something that is particularly relevant to what we're going through right now. And that's the battle with worry and anxiety. Uh, you know, the most joyful people in the world are often those who, who just seem to be the most carefree. Uh, not in the sense that they don't have problems or, or responsibilities or concerns, but they just seem to not get, ever get bogged down by those things. They just rise above it all. And as followers of Christ, we can be the most carefree people in the world in the sense that we don't need to get weighed down by anxiety. We take the Bible seriously in 1 Peter 5, 7 when it says to cast our anxieties on him because he cares for us. And I don't know where I heard this a definition. I don't think I came up with it, but I've used it so long I can't even remember. But it's this. Worry is taking responsibility for something God never intended, or at least not in the way he intended. There may be things that he wants you to take responsibility for, but if we're getting weighed down with anxiety, and we're, uh, then we're not trusting him as we should with those situations. Uh, you know, Jesus himself, I mean, he was constantly pressed by people and literally carried the weight of the world on his shoulders, and yet we don't see him going about in, in all kinds of hurried, scurried anxiety. And when we're serving his purposes, uh, we don't need to be anxious either. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, again, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. And that's when the peace that goes beyond anything we can understand will come into our lives. That's how we cast our cares on Him, through those times in prayer. And that's how we experience His peace. And again, peace and joy are probably the most powerful 
testimonies to others that, that we have a life that's surrendered to God's purposes. And that's what everybody's looking for. I don't care, believer, unbeliever, nobody will deny they're looking for peace and joy. And if they can see those things in us, we will have opportunities to share our faith and influence others for Christ. Philippians 4.13, a very well-known passage of Scripture, the one that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We hear that recited a lot and quoted kind of to mean we can accomplish anything, you know, we can do anything for God. But in the context of that passage, Paul is talking about all the things that he's endured and gotten through and how we stay content in all of it. And so it's not about accomplishment. It's about endurance and the fact that we can get through any and all situations with joy and peace as we trust Christ and keep our focus on him. And it's no coincidence that this passage comes out of Philippians, the book about joy, because the main way that Christ provides us with that strength to uh, endure and to overcome anything is through joy. Just as we start out by saying, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And one of the best examples of that, of how crucial joy is to our strength, comes from Hebrews chapter 12 too, describing Jesus himself. When it tells us to keep our focus on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And then it says, who the joy set before him endured the cross. You know what Jesus suffered on the cross was the most intense combination of uh, a physical and spiritual and emotional anguish that anyone has ever experienced Uh, with the weight of all sin of all time uh, bearing down on him. But it says that for the joy set before him, he endured all that. The prospect of opening that way for us to have a personal relationship with him, that's what gave Jesus the greatest joy. And that joy got him through the toughest thing anyone has ever experienced. So I think that God's joy can get us through the trials of life as well. So just kind of to sum it all up, The strength of joy, joy doesn't come from our strength. Our joy uh, comes from, uh, our strength comes from the Lord's joy. And that's the source, so it isn't based on, on what we've done. It's based on who He is and what He's done for us. And since God doesn't change, our reason for joy doesn't change. We can have joy in every situation. And when we feel we're lacking in joy, we look to serve uh, God through serving others. And when we do that, That's the most effective means of not only serving Jesus himself, but sharing our faith with others and influencing them to trust him as well. So I hope those are some things that may help you to have a greater sense of joy and to carry that through with whatever's going on in your life. And let me just as we close, uh, pray for you uh, this evening. And if you're struggling to find that sense of joy, uh, I pray that God will will just bring that on you tonight in a powerful way. Lord, I thank you that, that it doesn't have to come from us. Our strength, our joy, it doesn't come from anything within ourselves. But Lord, you've provided every reason and, and occasion for us uh, to have that joy. And your joy is our strength. And I pray for anyone out there who may be struggling to find that sense of joy, that sense of peace, and just this, the thing that, that's going to get us all through these these times. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, infuse them with that sense of joy, overwhelm them with just a sense of everything you've done for them and how much you love them. And, and Lord, to what you've called them into a relationship with yourself. And I pray out of that, God, they would take more joy than anything this life could ever produce. And that that joy would become their strength. That would be the reason that they can get through. Their eyes are fixed on you. And just as, Lord, you endured the the greatest opposition and and the greatest pain and suffering because of the joy uh, set was before you, Lord, help us with your joy in front of us and your joy within us that we would be able to endure and overcome anything. And in the process, others would see in us something they know that they need because everybody is looking for that joy. God, make us a joyful people. Lord, never let that joy leave us. And I pray that that in all circumstances, uh, you will give us a joy that just is undeniable. We'll give you glory for how you use us and how you impact others through us because of that joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So go throughout the week, uh, tonight, whatever you do, Uh, Do it with a sense of joy and let others see that we've got something real, that's something undeniable, something they need, and that is the joy of the Lord. And let the joy of the Lord be your strength.